In this video, we're going to describe periodic trends in ionization energy. Ionization energy is just the energy required to remove an electron from an atom. The periodic trend means we're going to describe how the ionization energy changes as you move across the period, or how the ionization energy changes as you move down a group. First, before we go into this, let's just talk a little bit more about the ionization energy. Let's imagine that we have a positive nucleus, and orbiting that positive nucleus, we have a single electron. We'll make it really simple. Of course, there's an electric attraction between the electron and the nucleus. And so if I want to remove this electron, which is what the ionization energy refers to, the removal of the electron, I'm going to have to put some energy in to do that because I have to break the bond, so to speak, between the proton and the electron. So in a picture, it would look something like this. You just take your nucleus, and you pull that electron off of the nucleus and away. And this is going to be a process that's going to require the input of energy. So ionization energies refer to how much energy does it take to pull the electron off the atom. And generally speaking, it refers to the removal of the first valence electron from the atom. Now, if we go back to our periodic table, let's now discuss how the removal of the electron, how much energy that requires as we move across a particular period. In general, as you move across a particular period, you might remember that the effective nuclear charge increases as you go across the period. And because the effective nuclear charge increases as you go across the period, that means that the valence electrons are going to experience a larger and larger and larger and larger positive charge as you move across a period. And so it's going to get harder and harder and harder to pull that electron away from the nucleus. We're, we're going to need to remember, though, that the force of electric attraction, that's going to depend on two things. So this F is for force of electric attraction. It depends on the magnitude of the charge. And we sort of get a feel for this by looking at the effective nuclear charge. It's also going to depend on how far the electron is from the nucleus. Both of these parameters... Uh, favor larger ionization energies as you move across the period. Because you might also remember, in addition to the effective nuclear charge increasing as you go across the period, that the um, distance of the electron from the nucleus is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And as an electron, as that radius gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, the electron is going to get closer and closer and closer to the nucleus. And so as that electron gets closer to the nucleus, if we imagine an electron, we'll say, compared to this atom, let's put an electron much closer to the nucleus. I'll just color it in black. If both of these are experiencing an effective nuclear charge of 1, this electron is going to be harder to remove because of the closer proximity between the electron and the proton. So the closer the proton, excuse me, the electron is to the nucleus, the harder it is going to be to remove. So both of these come to pass when you're talking about uh, ionization energy across the period. The increase in the effective nuclear charge as you go across a period increases the ionization energy. The shrinkage of the atomic radius also increases the ionization energy because that electron gets closer and closer and closer to the nucleus. Now that we know the general trend of ionization energy increasing as you go across a period, let's imagine what's going to happen with the ionization energy as you move down a particular group. In this case, it should be pretty easy to recognize that the ionization energy is going to decrease. It's going to get easier to remove the electron as you move down a group. That's because essentially all of the atoms in the same column have pretty much the same effective nuclear charge, but that electron is getting further and further and further and further away from the nucleus. And so if we look at, say, the difference between a lithium atom, in which we basically experience an effective nuclear charge of 1, we're going to put the valence electron in the second shell. So we're going to have a shell here and a shell here. And there's that valence electron that needs to be removed. Now we're going to compare that to, say, oh, the rubidium 
nucleus in which the valence shell is in the one, two, three, four. That's going to be the fifth shell. That's also going to have Z star approximately equal to one based on our Z star estimate. But that electron is going to be one, two, three, four, five shells from the nucleus. And so if we have an electron that's close to the nucleus, that's experiencing an effective nuclear charge of one. And another electron that's further from the nucleus, that's experiencing an effective nuclear charge of one, it's going to be much easier to remove this electron than it is to remove this electron. And so down a group, as you move down a group, the ionization energy tends to decrease because you're adding shells, but the effective nuclear charge is not increasing. So now I'd like to spend a little time to talk about how ionization energy increases as you go across a period. Now I know I just got done telling you that the ionization energy increases as you go across a period, which it does. But it doesn't just go up in a straight line. There's actually some hatches and bumps as you go across. And, and let's, let's look at this here. So what we'll do is we'll uh, plot on a y-axis here. We're going to plot the ionization energy in units of 10 to the minus 18 joules. You can think of that as an attajoule. Atto is the prefix for 10 to the minus 18. And let's see, this will be one attajoule, two attajoules, three attajoules, four attajoules. And then across here, we're going to plot the ionization energies of the various elements. So we'll start here with hydrogen at about two attajoules. And there's a huge increase to helium at about four attajoules. When you go to lithium, it drops down below one, a huge drop. So now, we've already seen, of course, as you go across the first period, there's an increase. Now we're going to start moving across the second period, lithium, beryllium, boron, and so forth. There's a slight increase as you go to beryllium. But then, instead of there being an increase as you go to boron, there's a slight drop. And then there's an increase as you go from boron to carbon. Another increase as you go to nitrogen. But when you go from nitrogen to oxygen, there's a dip. And then you get another increase as you go to fluorine. And another increase as you go to neon. And you're all the way across the period. There's a big drop. You go to sodium. And then there's a slight increase as you go to magnesium. Now, how, white, how might we be able to understand these fluctuations? as you move across the periodic table, or I should say as you move through the periodic table. This through here, this is the general trend right here from lithium to neon. This is the general trend through the second period from lithium through neon. Let's talk about that first. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the electronic configurations for each of these particular elements. So we'll start with lithium, which has a core of helium. And then we're going to start to fill the 2s. We're going to stick an electron in for lithium. And so this is the electron that I have to remove to get the ionization energy of lithium, which is quite easy to do because if you do that, then you've got that stable uh, helium electronic configuration. Now if we move to beryllium, we're going to put this electron in. And this is a little tougher to move because the effective nuclear charge has increased. And if we go to boron, we're going to start filling the 2p. What's interesting about boron is if we put this electron in here, this is the energy for the removal of this electron. And what we see is that if we remove this electron, we actually gain, rather than having a partially filled 2p subshell, we actually get a completely full uh, 2s subshell. And so by the removal of this electron, we gain that full subshell, and it's quite easy, actually, to remove boron relative to beryllium. Now, if we put in a carbon, an electron for carbon, and an electron for nitrogen, as we go across to nitrogen, uh, we get increases in ionization energy because we're getting increases in effective nuclear charge. But notice that when we hit nitrogen, we have a half-filled 2p subshell, which is relatively stable. That tells me that if I put an electron in for oxygen, if I'm going to find the ionization energy for oxygen, I'll be removing this electron right here. And I hope you see if you remove this electron, you end up with a half-filled 2p subshell. 
And that explains the slight dip in ionization energy that you see as you go from nitrogen to oxygen. Now if we move up to fluorine and then neon, we see that very high ionization energy in neon because we have a very high effective nuclear charge and we also will be disrupting the entire second shell being full. If we move over here to sodium, we're going to put an electron in the 3s. And of course, removing that particular electron is quite easy because that electron's further from the nucleus. We've now, you know, we're way out here in the third shell now, which is far from the nucleus. We have a very low um, effective nuclear charge compared to neon. And in addition to that, by the removal of that electron, we end up with a stable noble gas configuration of neon. Finally, we can talk about extra ionization energies of the elements. So, for example, if I was going to do a hydrogen, uh, we'll do helium, excuse me. We're, we're going to have the 1s orbital filled. We can talk about the first ionization energy, which is just taking that first 1s electron out. So we remove the electron. We'll stick it over here. But we can also have a second ionization energy. How much energy does it take to get this second electron out? And it's informative to look at this for, say, an element like lithium. So let's look at lithium. We're going to take the electronic configuration of lithium, which is 1s2, 2s1. And we notice that the ionization energy, the first ionization energy, for lithium, that is the removal of this electron here, that's going to be equal to 513 kilojoules per mole. And that's because, you know, that valence electron, here I'll do the effective nuclear charge of 1, so I'm going to write Z star here, estimate, that's 1. We've got two electrons in that first shell and one electron in that second shell. It's kind of easy to get rid of that. The second ionization energy, however, which would be the removal of not this electron, which we've already removed for the first ionization energy, but the removal of one of these two. In this case, the electron's much closer to the nucleus, and we would be disrupting that stable first shell being completely full. And look at the jump in ionization energy you get. 7298 kilojoules per mole. A huge increase in ionization energy massive increase over 10 times and so when you see this jump in ionization energy when you see that you can kind of tell ah there's probably a difference in shell here there's probably a difference in shell the removal of this one is probably one of the last few electrons in the outer valence shell and now when i'm moving this electron out i'm probably trying to remove an electron from a stable uh, full shell or a full uh, subshell Let's also look at the same thing for magnesium. Let's look at the ionization energies for magnesium and see if we can't make sense of these. So for magnesium, the first ionization energy for magnesium is 738 kilojoules for every mole. The second ionization energy is about twice that, 1451 kilojoules per mole. The third ionization energy we see a huge bump, 7733 kilojoules per mole. So you see sort of a linear increase. You just kind of double it to go from here to here. And then this jump is five times the energy. This is a two-time jump. This is a five-times jump. That's a huge increase. Well, let's see if we can't make sense of this by writing out the electronic configuration for magnesium. So I'll just write 1s2. 2s, two electrons, 2p, let's see, there's hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, this would be the 2p, and then the 3s, we get sodium and magnesium. So the first ionization energy for magnesium is the removal of this particular electron here, which is going to cost us 738 kilojoules. The removal of the second electron from magnesium is the removal of this one here, which is roughly twice the energy it took for the first one. This kind of means, this kind of tells us that the removal of these two electrons is probably from the same 
shell or from the same subshell. Now when we try to remove this electron here, you'll notice that's a huge increase. It's, it's much, much higher, and that tells us that we have probably tried to disrupt an entire subshell, or in this case, the entire second shell is full, and so the removal of that particular electron is really going to be tough. And this gives us some uh, a way of making sense of extra ionization energies for atoms, and this gives us some idea of atomic structure by studying ionization energies, the first, the second, and the third for particular elements.